The asphalt cowboys of America's highways rule the roads and supply our lives. Without trucks, America stopped. Within a week, their shells would be empty. But for some, the interstates are a hunting ground. We park, we go to sleep. We have no idea what's going on in the truck next to us. With 500 murders along America's highways, are predators drawn to trucking? He said uh, it's kind of like hunting, because once I got them in the truck, they were dead. Or does trucking create predators? And the killing doesn't end on the road. Find the break-in right now. He's at the front door. The police were not even near apprehending him. Grapevine, Texas, January 31st, 2004. Walking along Bear Creek, a father and daughter encounter a sight that will haunt them forever. The body of a young woman, naked, bloody, and broken. She appears to have been tossed from the highway overpass directly above them. And the incident is not unusual. Every week, grim discoveries are made along America's highways. These are not crime scenes. They are dump sites. And most offer little chance of solving the harrowing crimes they represent. Highway murder is the subject of Ginger Strand's 2012 book, Killer on the Road. Finding a body by the side of the highway is a particular problem for law enforcement. Not only do they not know who this person is, but they don't know where the person came from. Typically, a murder is investigated by looking at people close to the victim. Frequently, husbands are, are questioned right away. Boyfriends are questioned. Enemies, you know, all those things that you see on Law & Order. When you're looking at the interstate highway system, of course, none of those questions have any relevance. But law enforcement isn't always at a loss. The woman tossed from the overpass in Grapevine, Texas, had the word Seminole tattooed on her arm. She had no IDs, she had no clothes, she had no jewelry, nothing. The only thing that they had to identify her by was her tattoos. Within a week, the body in the creek regains her name and her story. She's 19-year-old Casey Jo Pipestem, a poet and promising athlete from Seminole, Oklahoma. Casey has scholarship offers for track. She has scholarship offers to, to play basketball. She was, I don't know, I guess everything a girl would want out of a little sister. But life was complicated for Casey Joe, who had been reported prostituting herself at truck stops. She was beautiful, talented, very, very smart. But there was something missing. And that something missing from Casey's life was a mother's love. We had a mother, but not there like we wanted her to be. And nothing could replace that. Casey Joe was last seen alive at a truck stop on the I-35 in Oklahoma. When her body is dumped in Texas the next day, it joins the ranks of over 500 other murders that have spread along the interstates like a virus on wheels. Originally, the interstate highways were seen as a, a beautiful uh, kind of road to the best of all possible worlds. They represented economic mobility, social mobility, and the American dream. The violence that then followed in the highway's wake turned that entire dream on its head. Very quickly, they came to be seen as highways to hell. But for 30 years, the data on highway murder just piled up. No one noticed a pattern until Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation analyst Terry Turner is handed a case that falls between two local jurisdictions. The victim was found along Interstate 40, about halfway between Oklahoma City and the Arkansas state line. 
an area where a truck could have pulled off or a vehicle could have pulled off and then re-entered the highway. She was found nude. She had bindings on her hands. Her head was covered. Just the whole environment or the whole scene was unique in, in what had been done to this particular uh, young lady. The victim's bodies often uh, tell us a story. If the body has been positioned in a certain way, there is a story there. And that'll be very important to distribute that information from city to city, from county to county, from state to state. We put out law enforcement communication between all law enforcement in the country. Within 72 hours, we found two other victims within the last two months that were very similar in nature. Turner is soon tracking seven unsolved highway homicides across four states matching her criteria. All seven of the girls were found fairly close to a major interstate highway, and there were three that were actually dumped off of an interstate bridge. My seven girls, she calls them, and Casey Joe Pipestem is one. And just like Pipestem, each had been selling sex at truck stops. Tragically, prostitutes are what people in law enforcement call throwaway people. And that's not because people in law enforcement think that they're throwaway people. It's because that's how the criminals see them. Prostitutes' friends and associates are frequently less willing to talk to the law. They don't want to talk about where they were last seen or what they were last doing. So all of this makes it easier for them to become victims of predators. These young women that work these truck stops are nameless, faceless people to society for the most part. But each day I would look at their picture and I knew that they were somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, somebody's mom. and. They became very, very important to me. Local detective Clark Fine of Hendricks County, Indiana, takes the same view. We're the protector of everybody. We don't just protect the rich people and the, and the homeowners. We protect everybody. Simultaneous with Terry's investigation, Fine is working the case of murdered prostitute Buffy Brawley, killed one month after Casey Joe. The 27-year-old mother was discovered off Interstate 74 south of Indianapolis. But here, the condition of both the body and the dump site contained telling information about the killer. Our investigation of the scene revealed that a truck had pulled in a large semi, pulling a trailer, had made a sweeping right turn. Uh, we could tell that by the tire tracks revealed through air photography and also on the ground. The victim's injuries point to a trucker as well. Buffy had burn marks to her wrists and ankles that was the result of what's called trucker's rope, which is the yellow rope they used to tie down equipment and tarps. She also had been hit with a tire thumper. We put out a lot of information to the press and to the uh, police computers asking for assistance. Within a couple days, I received information from Terry Turner, tied in our case with hers, and we exchanged information sometimes on a daily basis. Because of the evidence, the logical belief was that it was somebody in the, you know, in the trucking industry. Truckers are now squarely in the crosshairs for the murder of Buffy Brawley. But it's not until America's Most Wanted airs a story on Casey Joe that both investigations break open. I received a call from a woman who a claim that her nephew, who was currently in prison in Mississippi for a terrible murder, had bragged to her that he had killed a young girl in the Dallas, Texas area and thrown her off a bridge into a creek bed. The caller gave the FBI the name of former long-haul trucker John Robert Williams, who had just begun serving life in Parchman Prisons Unit 32, now closed for violence and squalor. He had confessed to the murder of Casey Joe Pipestem also that he'd killed several other girls and that he'd be willing to answer specific questions about cases. Detective Fine and his partner head to Mississippi to interview the killer. He was very personable, uh, seemed very intelligent. They find Williams so forthcoming, Fine wonders if he may be confessing just to pass some time. It seemed like everything I asked him, he agreed to. When Williams fails to recall one of Brawley's tattoos, 
Fine is ready to walk away. But then he volunteered information about another tattoo with the word ebony on her upper thigh. And he said, I thought that was funny because you usually associate the name ebony with black girls. And I knew right then this was our guy because Buffy Brawley did have a tattoo of the word ebony on her upper thigh because that was her daughter's name. Fine asks Williams why he did it, but never could have anticipated the response. He indicated to us that it was, it was kind of like hunting. He said, uh, the good thing is, he said, the animals come to you. He said, they would come up to our window. As soon as they tapped on our window, they were dead. He goes, because once I got them in the truck, they weren't going to go home. Killers like Williams are extremely dangerous. They're short, fused hotheads with uh, underlying rage towards women. And when they see these prostitutes circulating around the truck stops, they will have the deep hatred. And we often see a consistency with serial murder. They're attacking somebody that's just about their same status level, but just a notch below. So by murdering a prostitute, what they're doing by murdering her is putting her down and they're putting themselves up. Ultimately, Williams would become a suspect in at least three of Terry Turner's seven cases. But his alleged crimes are hardly unique. FBI analysts discovered their files hold over 250 homicides connected to the I-40 alone. In 2007, they secretly launched the Highway Serial Killings Initiative and rapidly cleared two dozen murders with two convictions and one person of interest. Each is a long-haul trucker. Today, at least 25 former truckers are serving time in America's prisons for serial murder. And prostitutes have been only the most visible of their many victims. Coming up, a teenage adventure turned journey to hell on 16 wheels. Caller says, I've left a Regina in a barn and I've made some changes. In 2007, the FBI quietly forms the Highway Serial Killings Initiative to match bodies dumped along the interstates with potential murder suspects. Two groups spike in their mounting database, prostitutes and truck drivers. If you're a predator, trucking is really kind of ideal because you are provided with this endless stream of people who are living already in the margins of the law. And you're traveling a lot from place to place. So it's easier to commit a crime and dispose of the body somewhere very far away. A semi can provide excellent cover. High above street level, it's private, secure, and soundproof behind idling engines. The thing that puts these girls in such great danger is they have to climb up into this big giant, it's almost like a, like a little building. So once that door shuts, they're completely at the mercy of the guy sitting there next to her. On April 6th, 2009, the Highway Serial Killings Initiative goes public. The announcement makes big news, and the FBI bluntly points out most of their 200 suspects are long-haul truckers. The vast majority of the truck drivers and the, and the transportation industry, they are good, hard-working people. And without them, our nation would come to a screeching halt. Unfortunately, between the transient lifestyle of the trucker that can be in three states in one day, that take their home with them everywhere they go, and the victimology of these girls at the truck stops. It makes that perfect storm for this type of crime to happen. Trucker Desiree Wood writes a popular blog about life on the long haul. Since I've been in trucking, I have met highly intelligent people, people with really big hearts, truckers that do animal rescue, children's charities. They are involved in so many good projects to help one another. But there's also some very extreme personalities out here. And every once in a while, you'll see something strange, but then you go to another town the next day, a whole nother environment. You know, we park, we go to sleep. We have no idea what's going on in the truck next to us. 
After 35 years at 16 Wheels, Sandy Talbot has earned her seat as trucking's outspoken grand dame. If I could say anything to any young girl that's having difficulties at home, the answer is definitely not to get out here to the truck stop. This is not an industry that will get you out of the small town or whatever issues you're having at home. You're taking your life in your own hands when you knock on that door. In February 1990, fresh-faced 14-year-old Regina Walters is seeking an adventure. She's left her dad in Tucson to try living with her mother in Pasadena, Texas for a while. But only a few days after meeting 18-year-old Ricky Lee Jones, the two secretly decide to hitchhike to Mexico together. A missing person report is filed for what police suspect is a runaway case. But in three weeks, the situation turns darker. Regina's father in March of 1990 had received a collect call. And the caller says, I've left a Regina in a barn, and I've made some changes. Mr. Walters asks, if she, is she dead or alive? And the caller hangs up. Regina's mother and grandmother also received these terrible calls. It was alarming, and obviously, there was some connection to Regina, because all the parents' phones were unlisted. Concern escalated from a runaway to possibly foul play. The couple were last seen in Ricky's hometown of Houston, also the home of long-haul trucker Robert Ben Rhodes, who was about to head back out on his route. Though no one saw them get into this 1988 Peterbilt semi, two months after their disappearance, a routine police check on that same rig reveals a shocking scene. On April 1st of 1990, uh, a semi was located on the shoulder of the road on Interstate 10 in Casa Grande, Arizona. Arizona State Trooper came up to inspect the truck, and when he looked into the cab, he could see a, a girl was chained and bound in, in, the, in the sleeper berth of this of the semi. She still had a horse bridle in her mouth. There was uh, evidence that she'd been whipped severely, and she was screaming and hysterical. The 40-year-old driver is armed with a gun, but quickly surrenders it, acting as if there is no problem that can't be easily explained. He was not threatening in manner. Uh, he was not threatening in appearance. But during the search of the truck by law enforcement, they found a briefcase that was later referred to as sexual torture kit. There was several pairs of handcuffs, chains. There was a dog leash, sexual devices, alligator clips, hooks and several whips. Yet throughout questioning, Robert Ben Rhodes remains cool, calm, and approachable. Okay. He jokes easily with his interrogator. Yeah. <laughs> and insists the sex was consensual, even while demeaning his victim. You don't screw around with the woman on the road. Not unless you want to get the drop off. <laughs> okay. But an FBI search of Rhodes' Houston apartment only reveals more horrors. The windows had been shaded so you couldn't see in the apartment. There were some bloody towels that were located. Again, more sexual assault tools and batteries used in specific types of, of torture. Investigators also find an extensive collection of bondage and torture pornography. When we're looking at these sexual sadists, they tend to be white middle-aged males. I mean, they give a nice guy appearance. But down deep, he's had this rage towards women, probably tracing back to early pre-adolescence. And then step by step through the years, he's cultivated these fantasies. By the time they're middle-aged, they have this pastime, and that is hurting women. Among the articles seized are various items of women's clothing and rolls of film that pose a chilling mystery. There was photographs of a young girl. A majority of them were taken in, in what we believe to be Rhodes's truck in various positions within the sleeper berth where she's bound. Then the photographs chronologically go to a location of a rural setting of a, of a barn and then she goes up into this loft, this hayloft, if you will, where she's bound with handcuffs and chains and then posed. 
Rhodes would especially enjoy looking at a photograph of his victims. This is first person. He relives it. But the photos are never enough. That just fuels their fantasy for the next kill. Rhodes spends the next seven months in an Arizona prison, serving the first part of a six-year sentence for kidnapping the woman found chained in his truck. He's about to be released on work furlough when, hundreds of miles away, in Illinois, a grim discovery in a broken-down barn along I-70 brings the case of Regina Walters barreling back to life. The victim had a garret around her neck, which is a very sadistic manner of, of committing a homicide. It was obvious that we were dealing with someone who had done this before. October 1990, long-haul trucker Robert Ben Rhodes is serving time in Arizona for the kidnap and torture of a woman found shackled in the cabin of his truck. He is set to be released on good behavior when a terrible discovery is made near a large truck stop in Bond County, Illinois. The body was initially located by a local farmer who had donated this barn to the local fire department to burn down for practice. And he'd went up into the loft with his flashlight and had seen the, the remains. Exposed to the elements, it will take forensics to determine even the age and gender of the victim. But the brutality suffered is immediately clear. Some wire was taken off of a bale of hay, and then a small board was broken from the veneer of the barn, placed into the garret, and then it's twisted down. The very sadistic manner of, of committing a homicide, it was obvious that we were dealing with someone who had done this before. Analysis reveals the body to be of a female roughly 14 years of age. The description produces a shocking 950 matches in the national database of potential victims. But one stands out. Missing runaway Regina Walters, whose family had received those chilling calls so many months ago. I left Regina in a barn. Immediately, we asked for dental records uh, from Regina and made a positive identification. It was indeed Regina K. Walters from Texas. And that's when the photographs come to light. In learning Regina was murdered in a barn, agents at Houston FBI are reminded of the haunting rolls of film in their file on roads. They actually had been sitting there since April, and now it's October. Experts determine the photographs taken by Rhodes document the last day of Regina's life. A spiral notebook confiscated from his truck is now recognized as having once belonged to Regina and lists the phone numbers of her family. On the inside cover, Rhodes added a cruel taunt on the fate of Regina's boyfriend. It had a picture of a knife dripping and it said, Ricky is a dead man. Ricky Jones will be missing until 2008 when he's finally identified from remains found near a Mississippi highway in 1991, driving home the chilling reach of Rhodes' trucking route. Looking back in Rhodes' trucking history, after a study by the FBI, there was 40 bodies that would have fit his time frame. A plea agreement signed in 1992 spares Rhodes the death penalty in the murder of Regina Walters. But serving life without parole, his crimes continue to follow him. He will see two more convictions for murder in 2012. I'm convinced that Rhodes would have kept killing because there was no nexus early on to any of the victims. He had also told the victim in Arizona as he was torturing her that he wouldn't be caught and that he had been doing this for over 15 years. In trucking, sadist Robert Ben Rhodes found the perfect job to both feed and conceal unthinkable crimes for which he showed no remorse. But can unstable minds be inflamed by life on the road? Are there truckers who are driven to kill? Very few people are actually looking into the mental health effects of trucking. Is there something in the industry, in the lifestyle, in the way that it's being practiced that's pushing certain individuals who might have those sociopathic tendencies over the edge?
It's 1998, about 15 miles north of Arcata, California. In a remote off-road location, this secluded campsite shelters a haunted man. His handmade map details strategies for staying away from people. Yet long-haul trucker Wayne Adam Ford is not on the run. Instead, he's trying to protect the world from himself. I tried to go out the woods and disappear because I was afraid of harming someone else. But the woods are only so deep. The problem was I wasn't completely in control of my thoughts. And I realized that I probably would harm somebody else eventually unless I was completely restrained. And so finally, I decided that I was going to have to return myself in. In the annals of serial murder, it's extremely rare to see serial killers turn themselves in. Typically, serial killers will just keep on killing because they enjoy it, because they believe they're invincible, and because they enjoy the game. Catch me if you can. Yet Wayne Adam Ford proves an exception to the rule. On November 3, 1998, the 36-year-old trucker walks into Humboldt County Sheriff's Office with a horrific piece of self-incriminating evidence in the pocket of his jacket, a plastic baggie containing a woman's breast. He brought it, he explains, to ensure the severity of his crimes will be instantly understood. Once I realized that I had it, I, I, I decided that I was ashamed of everything that happened. I wouldn't have to say anything. That was the whole point. In time, Ford recalls his trucking route hauling lumber from Nevada to the high desert of California and the women he murdered along the way. He describes dumping their bodies in aqueducts and irrigation ditches near Buttonwillow, Lodi, and San Bernardino. The police were not even near apprehending him, and they had no clue that it was him doing these killings. It was in this Airstream trailer that Ford confesses he dismembered his first victim and stored parts of her body. But evidence contrasts starkly with the friendly ex-Marine neighbors recall as funny and polite with a spotless truck. You could be a very, very good truck driver. Very neat, very tidy, and if you had some predatory quirks, no one would really ever be the wiser. Ford traces his murderous impulses to a severe head injury he claims derailed his career in the Marines and destroyed his personal life. It, it, it just completely altered my, my personality. After that point, my ability to control my anger uh, started becoming impossible. My, my sex drive became uncontrollable, got to where I was no longer in control of my life, really. Trucking might have offered a new start, but began an even darker journey. When Wade and Adam Ford started trucking, he was packing a lot of rage. Uh, he had gone through a bitter divorce. Because of his sexually violent demands, and then he starts trucking, which gives him so much time to brood, and he can nurture this grievance and accumulate this rage. So when he's out there driving his truck and he picks up prostitutes, they pay the price. And truck driving is, is exactly the wrong job for a person who was uh, in my condition. It exasperated everything. You had too much time to think about uh, personal problems. Uh, you were alone. Uh, Despite his record of mental health problems, Ford's defense does not enter an insanity plea. On March 16, 2007, eight and a half years after he turned himself in, Ford is sentenced to death in California. Maybe the man had a semblance of conscience, and that there was some guilt there. After all, he turned himself in. But when the jury saw 
what he did to those women, asphyxiating them, mutilating them, it's, it's so depraved, this jury decided, didn't make any difference if he turned himself in. This man's evil. Pressure and isolation at 39 cents a mile. It all comes to a rest at America's truck stops. But where sex traffickers are allowed to thrive, the yard can become an anonymous hunting ground. If you were going to go commit a crime where nobody really cares what's going out in the back 40, would you not go there? Most of us only know truck stops as civilian drivers or four-wheelers. We go to the side designated for us. The trucking side is separate, and it's a world of its own. The back row at a truck stop is always known as the party row, and that's the row where you go if you're interested in buying drugs or if you're interested in prostitution. The dealers and prostitutes come through the fence at the back of the truck stop and, and move through trying to avoid the truck stop security. For many truckers, the invasion is a menace. I remember one incident when I had to get up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom at like midnight and I walked in and there was a pimp playing a video game and he looked at me like, are you working my parking lot? Because I run this place. And I felt like I just invaded this person's territory, yet he was not a truck driver. He was running a business. Prostitutes circulate through the truck stop and knock on the doors of the trucks. And even if he's looking to get a good night's sleep, it's frequently very difficult. The truckers who aren't interested will often put a little sign in their window that has a picture of a lizard with a bar through it because tragically the women who work truck stops are known as lot lizards. And the situation is sometimes even darker than it appears. Some girls may be underage or acting against their will. Assistant Chief of Police Jim Walters establishes recovery practices for endangered minors. At any time, there are just short of 300,000 young people, children, who are at risk of exploitation in terms of trafficking in the United States. These are our children in our communities. So you have a young person who finds themselves in a situation where they're homeless, and they're dependent on the substances that they take that lessen and, and dull the pain. And very often, what they, they find to support themselves is the only thing that they've got left, and that's their body. Almost all the prostitutes I interviewed over the years, they all said the same thing. They started out at a very young age, usually 12, 13, or 14, that, which always surprises me. But this guy will come in, and he'll have a handful of money and a nice car, and they tell them how much they need them and how much they respect them. And they think, you know, I need to work for this guy. I need to give him money because he loves me. Truck stops are perfect for the trafficker because once the law enforcement's on you, you move 20, 40, 100 miles down the freeway to the next truck stop. You build in things like CB radios, and it's no challenge at all for the pimp to talk about where they're going to be at next and bring their customers to them. But many truckers are starting to push back against sex traffickers targeting their industry. The drivers have begun to have an outlet where they can speak outside of the cabs through social media and groups like Truckers Against Trafficking, educating them that maybe these people working in the parking lot are not doing it willingly. Maybe somebody else is pulling the strings back there. And here's some signs to look for. Truckers Against Trafficking was such a great idea because truck drivers are the eyes and ears of America. They see everything, they hear everything, and I'm a proud card carrier. It's, it's a great card. It, just, it has a national hotline number, the 1-800 number that drivers can call if they see something suspicious. People have been rescued by just one phone call from a driver. This is just right for, for a bad situation. 
Authorities believe 19-year-old Casey Jo Pipestem had been recruited into prostitution when she was still a minor. Her suspected killer, former trucker John Robert Williams, has been a person of interest in 14 murders in six different states along the I-40 corridor. And he's confessed to many more. He had advised that he had been killing girls since he was a teenager. I asked him a specific amount, and he said he thought, he wasn't positive, but he thought he'd killed 37 girls. And I said, how do you obtain all these girls? And he said, other than the first couple, which he actually abducted off the street, almost all the others were girls that got into his vehicle on their own. And he said he knew that they were looking for business. Uh, he was looking for somebody to kill, and it worked out for him. But pursuing multiple convictions can be difficult when killers cross state lines. In law enforcement, we have jurisdictional boundaries. The bad guys don't. The murder of Casey Joe Pipestem has yet to be prosecuted a decade later. The community in Seminole still feels the pain. In January on the anniversary of her ninth year memorial, we had a candlelight vigil in Oklahoma City. We didn't just light candles for Casey, we lit candles for the other victims as well. And the purpose of that was to let them know that just because y'all have forgotten, we didn't. We think about her every day. And we remembered her the way that we always remembered her. As, as beautiful. If John Robert Williams bragged that victims came to him, what happens when the killing moves out of the truck stops and on to Main Street? Now, when you look at Adam Lane, he would park his truck, and then he would prowl the neighborhoods. And if he found an unlocked door, he'd sneak in. Now, that gives a thrill killer great excitement that they can't keep me out. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 2007, a quarter mile off I-83. Homemaker Darlene Ewalt is brutally slaughtered with a fatal slash to the throat on her back patio. Two weeks later, local business owner Monica Massaro is found stabbed to death in her own bedroom on Main Street in Bloomsbury, New Jersey. The very next day, and 290 miles away, police in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, feel calls of terror from houses near the 495. Okay, we have... Okay, is it going through? He's trying to break in right now. He's at the front door. Then, at 4 a.m., the most harrowing call of all. A man came in with a gun and put it to my neck and my husband was there. The parents of Shay McDonough had confronted her attacker just moments before, after hearing her whimpering through the wall. He had his face covered with the mask and had the knife to her throat and he told her not to move or he would kill her. Chelmsford police take the knifeman into custody and find him heavily armed with exotic ninja-type weapons and choking wire. But background checks reveal no prior arrests for long-haul trucker Adam Leroy Lane. When they unloaded his truck, they took out a whole bunch of scary stuff and a cap that said, world's greatest dad. And I just thought, how does that work? Lane traveled with a film called Hunting Humans in his portable DVD player, but the most damning piece of evidence found in his truck would prove to be a simple receipt from Bloomsbury, New Jersey. He had bought a radar detector at the TA truck stop, which is the truck stop located right near Monica Becerra's house. If you stood on Monica's front porch and looked to your right, uh, you could see the truck stops down the street. The receipt was was dated uh, for Sunday, July 29th, 2007, at approximately 5 a.m. And the date and the time matched perfectly to the window that we believe Monica Massaro had been actually murdered.
Ultimately, Lane's knife will test positive for the DNA of Monica Massaro and Darlene Ewald, both attacked along with Shay McDonough in a two-week killing spree along his trucking route from North Carolina to New Hampshire. Lane was a thrill killer. They identify with other serial killers. They embrace horror. They're nobodies who become a somebody through murder. And by killing nice, appropriate, decent people, they send a shockwave through society. It's a feeling of power, you know, that they can't keep me out. The case of Adam Leroy Lane might make anyone vote down the building of a truck stop in their community, but opposing one can generate terrible, unintended consequences. Trucker Jason Rivenberg was shot dead in an abandoned gas station in 2009 when he could not find suitable parking for the night. The day Jason went missing, I had a doctor's appointment at 9 o'clock in the morning to schedule the C-section for our twins. And knew the guy he was driving for called me and said that he did not make his delivery time. A couple of hours later, the investigator from our sheriff's department came with a picture of Jason's tattoo for me to identify Jason. And then with the tattoo, there was no denying. The killer got $7 off Jason's dead body. It was his change from dinner. There's a big danger for the drivers out there. Since Jason, I am aware of at least 10 more drivers being murdered for money. After a three-year campaign, 2012 saw the passage of Jason's Law, dedicating federal funds to create safe parking areas where truck drivers can rest. It's not a luxury. It's something that they need. They're going out there making our world go around with little to no respect from anybody. They need this to be able to do their job and go home safely to their families. It's important to keep in mind that trucking is experiencing a, a huge boom. You'll see on the highway a lot, truckers with a, a bumper sticker that says, if you have it, a trucker brought it. And that's true. The vast majority of our commodities come to us via truck. That's what makes it so important to look at this industry with clear eyes and really try to make it be the best, safest industry it can be, because we depend on it. Anything and everything you buy, touch, or in your home, go to the store, comes by truck. I mean, it comes by ship, it comes by train, it gets to the ports, but it's not getting to your home until that truck arrives. A lot of people say, without trucks, America stops. I like to say, without truck drivers, America would stop. Within a week, the grocery store shelves would be empty. Just look around you. Put your hand on it and tell yourself this came by a truck because that's how it is.